so I won't think anything to that. Um, yeah, so thanks for inviting me up here. Um, yeah, so I work basically in the area which I call music informatics. This is probably one of the few places in the English speaking world where people know what informatics is, I assume, since you've got a building named after it and a school named after it. So I won't explain myself beyond uh, saying that my main work is in analysing recordings of music and trying to understand what's in the musical recording, so whether that is the rhythmic information or the harmonic information. So understanding it as a musician would understand it is really the, the goal that I have. Um, and this work is particularly looking at the aspect of pitch um, and looking at very fine differences uh, and some not so fine differences in the case of the work on singing. Um, so that's the outline of what I'll talk about today. I'll start by giving you a background. Um, I assume that some, we've got some people from the music department, some from informatics. I assume that not everyone has the same background in signal processing nor in music theory. Uh, so somehow I'll try to cover some ground very quickly just uh, and not make too many assumptions. Please stop me if you get lost and don't know what I'm talking about uh, and I'll try to explain it better. Um, so I'll give some background and I'll talk about two projects we've been working on the last few years with some of my colleagues. Uh, one is on estimating the temperament of the tuning system used on harpsichords from uh, solo recordings of harpsichord music. And, and then more recently we've been looking at singing and what happens when people sing without accompaniment. So there's no external reference for them to stay in tune to. And uh, what intervals do people actually sing and do they end in the same key they started in? Uh, and I'll talk a bit about that. And then at the end I'll show you a piece of software we've been developing. Well, I, I really my colleague Matthias Mark has developed uh, most of it um, for, for doing the, the pitch analysis for singing, um, which is certainly a useful tool, I think, in, for people interested in analysing uh, music, music performance. Okay, so the background. What is pitch? Uh, well, of course, if you don't know, you go and look at Wikipedia, and being the source of the whole world, we can find out it's a perceptual property that allows the ordering of sounds on a frequency-related scale. Um, and of course, if you're an engineer, you say it's the same as fundamental frequency, and then the music psychologist says, no, it's not. It's close, but it's not quite the same. Um, but certainly, if, if we're, for music, in the case of music, the fundamental frequency is in fact a very good approximation of, um, of, of what we perceive as, as pitch. The pitch is perceived on a logarithmic scale, so a doubling of frequency is, the, is a musical octave, um, and we divide the octave into 12 semitones. This is kind of how Western music has uh, developed. And these semitones are almost the same size. Uh, depends what century you're in. Um, and we'll talk about that with the case of um, harpsichord temperament. Uh, and then, of course, you can subdivide semitones into cents, which things which hardly anyone ever worries about, because you can get the you know, most music is expressed just in terms of you know, notes like F sharp and C, those things which are whole numbers of semitones apart. Um, and so we can think of, uh, and, and we will when we look at the, some of this work, think of that uh, our pitch as being some number, which is, this is then the equal tempered scale, where we assume that the note A4 is tuned to 440 hertz, and that gives you a reference point, and then you can calculate all other pitches by multiplying by, power, by, um, by 2 to the power of 1 twelfth, which is one semitone, and go up and down and build scales like that. Um, so that's just a formula which converts a frequency, which is the type of thing we measure in, in signals, into an integer, which happens to be the MIDI number if, if it's a whole number. But of course we can have a number like 60.3, which is somewhat sharper than a middle C, uh, which is 60. Um, as well as, I mean, so we're just using that as a, a way of measuring pitch. Um, so, because it's a convenient way of thinking about pitch in, in terms of um, units that make sense in terms of semitones rather than talking about 
frequencies which actually have nothing to do with the way we perceive the sound. Um, so, how does music work? Well, we have intervals, uh, the distance from one note to another note, uh, and we talk about thirds and fifths and octaves and things like that. Um, and these correspond to, to constant ratios. So you can have a third from C to E or from D to F sharp, or those are major thirds, and they all correspond to the same frequency ratio. So the divide the higher frequency by the lower one, you get some number like 1.25 or something close to that. Um, and somehow, and I won't go into the, the music psychology, but um, intervals will sound consonant uh, when some of the harmonics coincide on different notes. So if you play two notes at the same time and some of the harmonics coincide, then the notes kind of blend together and they sound nice together. So um, this means that in terms of the fundamental frequencies involved in the interval, that they're in some simple ratio, such as a ratio of 2 to 1 for an octave, or 3 to 2 for a perfect fifth, or 5 to 4 for a major third. Um, now, this is a very nice theory, and, and you know, it's a nice way to, to conceptualise music in um, very simple kind of terms, but it doesn't actually work in practice, because as uh, was discovered some millennia ago, um, these things don't add up. So if you have a, a ratio of, of 3 to 2 for a perfect fifth, and you know, a pure fifth is that's what you sing, if I, if I ask you to if I sing a note and ask you to sing a fifth above that, then you'll probably sing frequency ratio of 3 to 2. Um, but what happens is if you keep going up these fifths, you go from C to G to D to A to B, you go around, eventually you get back to C again. But you don't. Right? The, number you get, the note you get back to is out. It's not the same C that you started on. Um, even though the piano keyboard would suggest that it should be the same. Um, so the problem is that if you, this is 12 fifth intervals, so that should be 12 times 7 semitones, is not equal to 7 octave intervals. 7 times 12 semitones. Even though mathematically you'd think that 12 times 7 equals 7 times 12. That's what I was taught at least in primary school or high school or sometime. At least university maths. Um, and if you think of a semitone as being, as all semitones being equal, as in the, at least in the 20th century is being kind of, and into the 21st is the kind of the standard way of conceptualising music. Um, that we have these, these, this unit, 2 to the power of 1 twelfth, um, then, of course, intervals such as a fifth, which would be 2 to the power of 7 twelfths, that's not the same number as 1.5. Uh, these numbers aren't precisely the same. So, so nothing lines up precisely. Um, so that's our problem. Uh, and it's been our problem for, for centuries, and some centuries ago, people proposed uh, solutions. In fact, since Pythagoras, people have been um, trying to, to solve this. And the mathematician would look at this and say, well, how do you solve this equation? 3 over 2 to the power of 12 equals 2 to the 7. Well, just make 3 a little smaller. <laughs> and then it's fine. <laughs> right? So that's the engineering approach. Maybe not the mathematician's approach. But for smaller, slightly smaller values of 3, this equation is actually true. Um, so for what we do for fixed pitch instruments, such as keyboard instruments, we actually don't have much control over the pitch. Somebody else usually tunes it, or if it helps to a player, you can probably tune your own up to chord. Um, but once it's been tuned and you're playing a piece of music, you can't jump in there and retune a note. So you have to decide in advance what all these intervals are going to be. And what happens is that you adjust some of the fifths, or all of them, um, so that they're not quite this 3 over 2 ratio. You generally you want to keep the octaves as being the, the 2 to 1 ratio. Uh, maybe you want to get some of the thirds to be a 5 to 4 ratio. Um, and there's different ways of doing this. One way you can do it is to, to say um, we want it to sound, the keyboard to sound good in some keys because we're playing this piece in C major so we want it to sound good in C major we don't care how it sounds in F sharp major because we're not going there. 
right? And that's one way you can tune it. Uh, another way to tune it is the more modern approach to equal temperament, where you say, let's make all keys sound equally good, or if you're a, a, a kind of an early music fan, equally bad, you would say, right? By, by making all of the fifths out of tune rather than having at least some of them in tune. Um, so that's the, the doctrine of equal temperament, which you know, has actually kind of taken over the world as, as the kind of the standard way of thinking about music. Um, now, of course, if you're a singer, this is not a problem to you at all, because you can adjust your note to fit the musical context, right? You're not constrained. Every time you sing C, you can sing a different pitch. Fit it to, so if somebody else is singing a G, you have to sing a C. You can choose the one that fits with that G, and if somebody else sings a, then an A, you can fit it to that, and it might be a different C to get the pure intervals. Um, of course, when you do this, um, what can happen over time is <coughs> there's no fixed pitch reference at all that the tonal centre will drift. So C will not be the same from the beginning of the piece to the end of the piece. And, and there's been some very interesting work where people have composed pieces of music to emphasise this pitch drift and even to cause pitch drift. And even within 12 bars, I can get kind of a, a choir of very good singers to drift down a semitone by singing in tune, by getting these singing pure intervals. Um, so, so that's kind of the background of what temperament and, and pitch drift are. Um, now I want to describe some work. So I'm a music informatics person. I don't really specialise in, in music theory or that type of thing. I just have some background. Uh, what I'm good at, I guess, is, is measuring what musicians do and comparing it to theories and, and seeing how well do people actually do what they say, do, they, do people sing in tune, do people tune harpsy chords uh, the way they say they do, and of course they no, don't. No, no. Oh, I forgot to show them my beautiful picture of, of historical temperaments. So this is a way of thinking about what you, the way that you can solve this problem. Right? If you've got this problem of these two sides of the equation not really adding up, and so you're adjusting things, adjusting some of the fifths, um, one way of conceptualizing it is, is this, you have to kind of squeeze some of the fifths. So some of them can be pure and some can be squeezed by a certain amount. And so we have these diagrams to show the difference between uh, the Lottie and fifth comma and sixth comma mean tone temperaments. Um, but I don't really have time to talk about that, so I'll go on and talk about um, this work on analyzing harpsichord recordings. Um, so, this arose in, in collaboration with a, a colleague, Dan Tiddar, who is a, an excellent harpsichordist. He performs and plays a lot. Um, and he's very interested in, in temperament and quite passionate about it. And, um, and so we thought, is it possible, was the first question, is it possible to measure pitch so accurately that we know what this tuning system that, that was used on a particular recording? Because um, Anyone who works in transcription or uh, generally, you know, the, what we do in music informatics is we, we measure pitches to the nearest semitone, and that's great if we can get the right notes. That's all we want, right? <laughs> We're not really, we don't, never really cared. And in fact, if something 10 cents or 20 cents out, that's just noise, we throw it away, we're not interested. But of course, for temperament, it's the opposite. We want to know precisely was it tuned 5 cents sharp or flat compared to the equal tempered interval, because that's what tells us. Uh, what the tuning system is. Um, and we want to do this automatically. Uh, we don't want to assume that we know which harpsichord is being used or what piece of music is being played, although of course those things could possibly help us because they give us information about uh, things like in harmonicity if it's the instrument or of course the score that you know which notes to expect. Um, but we're particularly interested in, in large-scale quantitative studies, and we're currently doing some work on an um, AHRC-funded um, big data project where we're looking at a larger-scale larger analysis of, of uh, harpsichord music. Um, and the idea is that not to replace, but to complement the traditional approaches to, to, um, to historical music, kind of historical performance practice research, which doesn't deal with the, the big data case and looking at the big picture of well, what do people actually do? Uh, quite often the, the, the historical approaches 
look much at, more at kind of the theory. Uh, what did people write about? What did they say they were doing? Um, and of course, we don't know what people did 200 or 300 years ago because we don't have the recordings. But we have you know, what they say, their, their recipes of how they tuned the instrument, but we don't know how accurate they were. Uh, but we can measure now how accurate people are. We can compare what they say with, with what they do. We're interested in that. Um, so this work has uh, developed from uh, the first two data sets, which was our first attempt and our first paper we wrote on the topic, uh, where we took uh, four short pieces of music, like the um, first prelude from the uh, Walter and Clavier and a few others by other composers, and uh, put them in six different temperaments. And we did this twice, once with a synthesizer, because we wanted to have some ground truth where we knew that exactly how each pitch was tuned. Um, so we did this with uh, there's a physical modeling synthesizer, which is quite good quality. Um, so we tuned these pieces to, to six different temperaments and created audio recordings that way. We did the same with, with Dan, took his harpsichord and played these four pieces, retuned his harpsichord to a different temperament, played them again, and did this several times. Um, and once for each, each temperament, so we have the parallel set of, of human-tuned, real harpsichords, so it's maybe more difficult um, data to analyse because synthesizers tend to have this clean sound which always helps you somehow in automatic analysis for some reason. Um, and then we, in the second um, the paper we did in this work, we, we expanded the data set. We found a, a number of CDs where on the sleep notes, they said, oh, the harpsichord is tuned in the velocity temperament, or some comment like this. Um, and so we thought, that's interesting. Let's, uh, let's have a look and see if it really was. Uh, so we found, of these 22 cities, there were 15 different temperaments mentioned. Um, and then more recently, we've expanded the set of another 90 CDs of solo harpsichord music, where we don't know what the temperament was, but we wanted to have a kind of a bigger, more exploratory study and look at uh, what other temperaments are used. Or do they all kind of, can we cluster them? Can we, what can we learn about it? So um, that's the more recent work, which is still ongoing. So the steps. We start off by uh, identifying the presence of tones. So is a note being played? If so, which one? Uh, and the approach we're taking is what we call a conservative transcription. Uh, you might not have heard of this term, but it's, the idea is just to just transcribe the music, but not try to get all the notes. Just get the notes that you're sure are there, because you don't want to make too many mistakes. And if all we want to know is where was each note on the keyboard tuned to, um, then we don't actually need to get every instance of that note. Right? If the middle C is played a hundred times in a piece of music, and in some cases it's played with some other notes, in other cases it's played with no other notes. But we'd really prefer just to get the, <laughs> the clean recordings um, because it's not going to change its tuning during the piece. Right? So we don't need to get every single note that was played as you would if you were trying to transcribe a piece of music. We just need to find some nice examples of each pitch so that we get a good idea of how the harps of course being tuned. Um, Okay, so that's the idea of conservative transcription. Um, having done that, we then do, we perform a very precise pitch estimation, uh, which is described on the next slide. Um, and then we do this over a whole piece of music. And so, because most pitches are played a number of times during a piece of music, we get a lot of different measurements. And in fact, because we're analysing short slices of audio, even a single note will give us a number of independent measurements because we analyse the different uh, frames of, of audio and get different values perhaps, or, or similar values hopefully, um, for the, the pitch. And so we can put all these numbers together, use some type of robust statistic, such as the median, um, to, to give us a single value for each pitch class, so we're assuming octaves are all tuned fewer. So we throw, kind of fold all the octaves together, um, and then we, so we get 12, 12 numbers, one for each pitch class, saying basically 
how it was tuned relative to this theoretical kind of A equals 440, you know, so A force 440 hertz equal temperament, uh, just as so we have some scale to measure it on. Uh, and then we express it as these deviations that, um, of course, you know, they're intended deviations, they're not just mistakes or anything. And then we compare it with if we have, for example, on the sleep notes, or if we ourselves tune the piano, um, you know, the harpsichord to a particular tuning, then we compare it with that temperament and see how it compares. Um, okay, so a technical word for those who do signal processing um, on the pitch est estimation. Um, so most pitch estimation has been around for a very long time because ever since uh, at least the 1960s, people have been lots of, doing lots of work on speech recognition. Uh, people have been trying to find ways of estimating pitch, and they've come up with some great ways. And the music signal processing community has kind of picked them up as the decades have rolled on from the speech community. Um, but, um, of course, in speech, uh, you tend to assume that there's only one person speaking at a time, right? Because that's polite, so the way we communicate. Um, and, you know, there might be some background noise, there might be some other people speaking, but that's kind of treated as noise and there's a predominant thing. In music, you can't assume that, right? It's quite common for people to play notes at the same time. It's not considered impolite at all. Um, we also assume, um, so a lot of signal processing approaches tend to assume stationarity, that is that signal characteristics don't change rapidly. Uh, also not true of musical signals. Um, even the house record, which has a very steady pitch, uh, has a very fast decay, right? So the characteristics of the sound are changing within the analysis frame, and those types of things are not, uh, often not taken into account in, in, um, in pitch est estimation techniques. Um, most approaches for estimating pitch assume harmonicity, that is that the partials, so all of the frequency components in the sound, are at integer multiples of some fundamental frequency, and um, that's the you know, fundamental frequency is what we're trying to find. Of course, this is, is the case for, for some musical instruments, but not for s string instruments, for example, where the stiffness of the string causes inharmonicity, which is very uh, apparent in the piano, for example, or the guitar, uh, less so in the harpsichord, but still very much measurable in the harpsichord, um, that the, the high partials are sharper than the inter integer multiple of the, um, of the fundamental frequency. And uh, the other assumption, of course, that in most pitch estimation work, and certainly in the music informatics area, is that you know, measuring to the nearest semitone is all you need. Right? We don't need uh, very high precision. Um, and of course, that's not the case for what we're interested in for this work. Um, so we looked around and found there are some, some methods that can be used for, for high, uh, high precision pitch estimation. Um, and compared various ones. I mean, we threw out the periodicity-based ones don't work uh, in the case where it's where you can have more than one note present at the same time. So we looked at the um, various kind of frequency-based methods and, and phase-based methods as well, and found that the, the best performing one is surprisingly is perhaps the kind of you know, the most basic. Uh, Signal processing is just, you know, it's based on the fast Fourier transform uh, with zero padding, with quadratic interpolation, and with correction for the, the bias due to the window function. These are things which are um, quite well understood, and, you know, it's been maybe the correction for the bias of the window function is reasonably, you know, that's 2004 or something, but the other stuff goes back a long time, and they're, they're standard techniques. Um, but with this, we can actually get a resolution down to, uh, we think, one or two cents. So this is, um, talking to harpsichord tuners, this is certainly as well as anyone can tune a harpsichord. Um, and, and it's certainly below the just noticeable difference for, for the, um, hearing the pitch differences. So, you know, it's, it's very good resolution and it's certainly, if you compare it to the errors that people make when they sing, it's, at least in order of magnitude better. Um, so, 
so those are the, the techniques we use. We also, um, in, in the uh, paper in, in JASA 2012, we also looked at the estimated inhomicity of the harpsichord and used that in the, in the algorithm and, and doing a loop of kind of correcting for the inhomicity as well and then re-estimating the, uh, the pitches we found that we could even get slightly better performance. But basically, you know, it's not impossible to get uh, very high precision uh, pitch, pitch estimates in the context where there are a number of notes playing at the same time. Um, just have to do it a bit carefully and make sure you're not get, getting partial, you're not measuring a partial from a different tone than the one you think you're, uh, it belongs to. Um, okay, so what does our data look like then? So I, I said that we kind of summarise all of our data down into this uh, 12 dimensional vector. And so this is what I'm displaying here. See if I can explain this in some sensible way. So for each pitch class, C, C sharp, D, so we're treating D flat and C sharp are the same thing because that's what, you know, the same key on the keyboard. Of course, musically they have different meanings and if you're tuning the keyboard, you tune it differently, whether it was going to be C sharp or D flat, but for our purposes, we'll just call it these things and not worry about whether they should be sharps or flats. Um, so for each one, we have many, many measurements, <coughs> and that's what you see here. All of these points are the different measurements for every time somebody played a C in this particular piece of music. Uh, and if, this, if it's just a dot, then we're saying we're not very confident of it. And if it's a big circle, we're saying we're very confident because we got a lot of values that all agree with each other from independent those bits together or whatever. So what you see here is, you know, we have a number of measurements which were outliers. So yes, our outliers. And if you look at the range, it's a range of you know, 10 cents or so uh, around the kind of central value. But basically, most of the value is somewhere in here, in this range. Uh, and, and so that's our median value as well. And so that's the value we take for C. So we're saying that C is tuned approximately 7 cents sharper than our kind of equal tempered 440 hertz. Or actually, probably, probably adjust this to 415 because all the early music is based on uh, A being tuned around 415 hertz. But it doesn't really matter. Well, it does matter because we've changed the names of the pitch classes, but let's say we've got that bit right. We know what key of pieces we're in. Um, and we do that for each pitch. So we can get we can say that here's uh, C sharp and here's the D, and we get here kind of some measure for how uh, far away from equal tempered. So if this was equal tempered, you would see a straight line. Right? If it was tuned to, to, you know, this, some, to the reference pitch that we expected, it would be a straight line at zero. If it was tuned slightly sharper, slightly flatter, then you'd see a straight line you know, above or below zero. Um, but here, what we see is that the, and this is, so this is the data from our synthesizer. So our measurements um, almost agree, as you can see. The median value is, is very close to, well, actually, I haven't, I'll take that back. So this is not the median value. This blue line is the theoretical temperament. So this is what we told the synthesizer to play. Um, and these are the, the independent estimates. I haven't put the actual the values that comes out. But what you can hopefully see is that the, they agree very closely, but within a cent or two, that the kind of the central kind of value for each of these clusters is approximately what it's supposed to be. Um, now, that's good. Synthesized data, so we're sure of the tuning. Then we go to our acoustic data. So these are our six pieces that Dan tuned and played on his harpsichord, and we see something similar, um, but it's not quite as nice. Uh, but we see that, in fact, this note. Now, the question is, who's right? Is our method suddenly not working because it's a real, a real harpsichord? <laughs> or did somebody not tune the harpsichord so precisely? Right? And if all of your measurements <laughs> are like this, uh, from lots of different frames, lots of different instances, different, um, then I'm going to claim that actually no, our measurement's working well. 
we can estimate pitch very well, but it wasn't all that well tuned. Um, and this is what we're going to see when we look not just at a, well, I guess an amateur, semi-professional harpsichordist doing it, but if you look at commercial CD recordings, you see that the same type of thing happening, that, that uh, the temperaments are not precisely what people say they are or think they are. And we see some interesting things here that you get some bimodal distributions, for instance, you get some two clumps of bass, and they're probably, it's probably an octave that's not tuned perfectly purely. Um, okay, so that's what our harpsichord temperament data looks like. Um, the next step is then to perform classification. So taking away this blue line and saying, just, just given this blur of, of data, we calculate the median for each of these bridge pitch paths and come up with a set of 12 values. And then we want to measure well, which temperament is the closest to them. Of course, it's not too hard to kind of measure the distance from, from this point to the median of, of these points and combine them in some way using sort of a Euclidean distance, or in fact what we do is we use a, a weighting and we weight the notes by their durations um, and, and also by the consistency of estimates. So if all the estimates cluster very closely together then we're more confident that the values are correct. Um, then we have to adjust for the tuning reference because we don't know what whether it's tuned to A equals 440 hertz or 415 or 423 or 397, you get quite a wide range of early music. Um, so we adjust, we find the tuning reference that minimizes this difference between a theoretical and an observed temperament profile and then choose the temperament profile that is closest uh, to what we have observed in the data. And then we compare the data with what the sleeve notes say and say, well, how often do people who say they tune with a lot actually tune with a lot temperament? Um, so here's an example of um, a profile. Now we're showing three different ones. Sorry that one of them is green, which is always hard to see on the projector. Um, so the black points are the observed. So that's our data. They're the median values that we calculated from all of our hundreds or thousands of observations. Um, and then the red ones are a temperament profile that matches most closely and actually matches very closely. Right? These differences are only order of two or three cents. Or so um, whereas the green temperament is the ground truth. So this is the temperament which they said they tuned to according to the sleep notes. They said that we tune uh, G sharp down here and D sharp up here. Um, but actually, they didn't. Um, so it's interesting, we find these cases where, where in fact the tuning is not precisely what, what people claim or think. Um, and The, the results are very difficult to quantify because there's a, a huge mixture in the, in the data. Some of the, the data is clearly tuned by some, the, the harpsichord's been tuned by somebody who really believes that this temperament is exactly the right way to, to tune and <laughs> tunes it that way. Um, some, it's kind of close, but it's not quite there, maybe like the one we just looked at. Other ones, it's just totally different. Um, and, and the question then comes, why? Um, one reason that we could get a wrong temperament, and this happens in some uh, cases, is that not every piece of music has every pitch class. Like there are some pieces which don't have the note G sharp in them. Sure. Right? Or that note. Mm -hmm. So how do you know if that note doesn't occur, you don't know what the note's tuned to. So of course, you know, you won't always have complete information. Um, but I think Try to understand what's going on from a kind of a more um, musical point of view. Why would somebody say they're tuning to Lottie and then not do so? Uh, don't they know what Lottie is or what are they tuning down for? What's, what's the reason? What's going on? And of course, um, what 
we know from you know talking to, to harpsichordists and tuners is of course there are practical issues that you don't always have time to tune all that precisely. And we, remember we're talking about distinctions here which are really at the, the threshold where it's not really possible to hear from listening to the, the note by itself. You have to play notes together to, to hear how they blend to then know how to adjust. Uh, so we can't hear that just by so, you know, playing a scale or something, you won't know how to, to tune the, the, um, the note. You know, the adjustments are very fine. And also physically, it's, you know, there's a limit to you know, the physical movement that is required to adjust a note by one cent. Um, it's also a skill to, to develop. Um, so, so that's one, one issue is kind of this, this time. Um, another issue is, of course, there's, there's a set of, of uh, names for temperaments, but of course, tuning of, of any pitch is, uh, is on a continuous scale, right? It doesn't belong to one of a set of discrete categories. So, of course, somebody could tune halfway between one temperament and another and then not have a name for it. So then they have to write something in the CD sleep notes, or they feel they have to write something, and they just say, oh, it's Velotti. I mean, I, th I keep saying Velotti because that tends to be what people say. Um, and uh, from what I understand from tuners that I've talked to, uh, sometimes you're asked six months after the recording, oh, we're writing the sleep notes, we're going to release the CD now, can you tell us how you tuned it? And they have a clue. <laughs> they say Velotti. Right, so there are certain reasons why there are you know, huge differences uh, sometimes. So, you know, there's um, the practical and theoretical considerations are always the same. So the academic literature has focused very much on the, the um, theoretical considerations, which you know, uh, are not really how life goes from day to day. Um, so, we conclude, ground truth is not always scientific truth. Right? So, we would treat something written on the CD sleeve notes or you know, the notes in the score or those types of things, we treat them as ground truth, as if that is, you know, our automatic algorithm has to return exactly the same thing as what's written down. Um, well, I don't think that's always the right way to go. Sometimes, actually, we can measure more accurately than, than what people have, have written down because of, we know what, what they're writing down is not actually a, a scientific statement. It's just a kind of a, perhaps a starting point. And quite often people will say, well, that was, yes, I tuned to this temperament as a starting point, and then I adjusted it so it would sound good in this piece. And by doing so, they might have <coughs> moved closer to another temperament without realising it. Um, okay, so we say that content based analysis to this type of work has uh, an important role in understanding historical performance practice. Um, we can go back at least, you know. To the beginning of recorded music and, and see how over the, the decades, and we did this in recent, uh, in recent paper, um, we looked at how you know, in the 1930s everything was kind of equal temperament and then in the 1980s everyone shifted towards this historically informed music performance and the practice and they started using the old temperaments a bit. Uh, so you see this kind of the, the, just the uh, um, how much the temperance used in a, in a time period changes with the, the fashions of the time. Um, okay, so that is harpsichord. I shall now talk a little bit about singing, which is the other side of this <coughs> pitch analysis work. Um, so, intonation is defined as something like pitch accuracy, right? in a realisation of a note, so you're asked to sing a note, how accurately you sing it, uh, is your intonation. And this is reported in, in literature, talking about choir rehearsing, as kind of the main priority, or one of the main priorities, uh, that people practice and, and try to get right. Um, and there's been observed, so this is a, a background, you know, with read, uh, uh, people saying that, you know, particularly in, in choirs where people are singing unaccompanied, that the conductor gets very frustrated with the choir when they finish half a semitone flat and then they start it. And says, go and do it again, practice it again, do it again, do it. it's not right, it's still, still going flat. Um, and so we kind of wanted to understand what's going on here. Um, 
So David Howard at York University has done this uh, really interesting work on the relationship between the harmonic progressions and how they induce drift. In, uh, um, but in fact, drift exists without harmonic progression. So it's not just me drifting because I'm trying to sing a pure fifth with, with you, uh, and that causes me to just move away from the kind of the, the, the beginning reference speech. Um, clearly, in solo singing, there's an issue of memory, right? That, that you have no reference at all. There's no one else making any sound. It's just you and each pitch that you produce has to be based on your memory of either the most recent pitch or the pitches going back in time and clearly our, our memory must be limited and so in some sense you know, drift is, is just about forgetting the reference pitch over time. So we want to measure this uh, and our first experiment we took a song that we thought everyone knows and everyone agrees on what the notes are. We found that it wasn't quite the case, but uh, at least in most cases. We found 24 people out of 28 who agreed on the melody of Happy Birthday. Um, and we got them to sing it a few times. And we tried a few different conditions, which ended up telling us nothing, but they, they, they sang Happy Birthday three times, and then they sang it three times again, but the second time they did it with, uh, with some noise played during the second rendition just to see whether the acoustic feedback helps them to stay in tune or, or, in, you know, or doesn't, so we thought that we could play some noise. As it turned out, it made no difference. They also tended to sing louder when the noise was being played, so they kind of compensated themselves. Um, then we tried something else. We said, well, is it the muscles? Is it because it's so hard to sing high notes that we get lazy and, and end up singing flatter over time, which is kind of one of the theories of why people tend to, to sing flat. Um, so we asked them for the second rendition to just imagine Happy Birthday in their mind and not sing anything. So they just sang it once and then they had a click track so they knew how many had to be the full length of Happy Birthday. But they just imagined it and then they sang it the third time, which in this case was the second time they'd sang it, uh, to see whether that makes any difference. It made no difference at all. Um, <coughs> okay, and then we assessed how well people sang in terms of the interval error. Uh, so we're assuming here equal temperament. We'll talk about that later if I remember. Um, so the score, of course, we know the melody for Happy Birthday. We know what interval should occur. We didn't give people a starting note. We didn't everyone sing, sing in a pitch key that they was, they're comfortable with. And of course, a, a non-expert singer might start on a note which causes them to later reach uncomfortable notes. We let them do that if that's what they did. We didn't try to stop that. Which maybe wasn't the best idea. But, um, so we were looking at the interval errors and then we looked at pitch errors, so actually how out of tune was each note um, relative to the tonic, but of course we don't know what the tonic is, we have to infer that from the notes, and sometimes it's not so easy to infer because every note or every interval is out of tune, so what is the reference? Right? We don't, you know, there isn't an absolute reference in this work, so, um, so we did some. Um, fitting of the data to a, a model, and then we looked at how the pitch drift occurred, and that was quite easy to do because you can just you've got the first and third uh, versions of Happy Birthday, and you can just look at the difference between the first note, difference between the second note, and the corresponding notes, and average those 25 notes, uh, and that will tell you how much you've changed key from the first run to the third run. Um, okay, so what does singing data look like? Unlike harpsichord data, when people sing a note, they don't sing a constant frequency. Um, so we did some, well for this work in fact we did some manual annotation where we were actually saying where the notes began and ended. Um, now we have an automatic system which does this for us. Uh, we have a pitch estimation algorithm called, based on yin, but I'm doing some slightly clever real things. To, that gives a slightly better performance. Um, and then this is what the pitch estimates per frame look like. All these crosses, which may not look like crosses to you, but this wavy line. But this is what people really sing. And this is then the medium of all of those values between the onset and the offset, which is what we took as the, the pitch of that note. No idea whether that's what people perceive as a pitch, 
but I don't know that anyone has actually done an experiment in the music psychology world really accurately matching kind of a pitch trajectory to a sinusoid or something that would tell us what the perceived uh, pitch actually is. Um, okay, so, so that is a, a reasonable um, thing to do, I think. And, and so you, you get then from these median values for each note, you can work out the intervals and compare that to it's supposed to be two semitones and it's you know, 2.1 or whatever, then you can talk about uh, interval errors. So here's some interval errors. Uh, this is sorted by interval. So if the interval should have been minus 5, which means you go down 5 semitones, uh, people sound a bit flatter than that, uh, and so on. Uh, so the interesting ones, well, the octave, people seem flat, right? When they have to jump up an octave, they don't quite make it. In fact, some people really don't make it by a long way. Um, anyone spot the real outlier? The real outlier is here. Zero. Right? The easiest thing in the world. Sing the same note twice. It's significantly sharp. And this is totally just because of the piece of music. It's supposed to go happy birthday, but it actually goes happy birthday. A lot of people interpolate and they go up, and especially when you go happy birthday, they sing happy birthday. The second note, it's supposed to be the same as the first one, but it goes up in, in uh, anticipation of the big jump, or even in the case of the, the second note of the piece, just in the case, in, as a kind of a, I don't know, a, a variation of the tune, I guess. Um, so that's you know an unexpected result, but then it made a lot of sense in the context of the piece and, and listening to how people sing. Okay, that's what they do. Um, so this is by note number. So now you can see the whole of the ha piece "Happy Birthday" and see how each interval is sung. And you can see, particularly here's the, the big one where it's just before the octave jump. So here's the octave jump, um, and so people are anticipating that jump by already going up in pitch. Um, Oh, quite a lot. Um, okay, so that's the data. Uh, look at the paper if you want to see it in more detail. Um, we then want to understand what's going on and, and try to build a model that to explain um, what was happening. And the idea was that uh, intonation is, is based on two things. Right? That when you try to sing a note, you have some reference and it doesn't matter what the reference is. Let's say for all the musicians in the room, then we can pretend the reference is the tonic note. And then if you have to sing, if you're in the key of C and you have to sing E, you try to sing a major third above that tonic note, right? But it doesn't matter what the reference is. It could be the previous note, and it could be the, then you're trying to sing the interval from the previous note to the current note. It works the same. Um, it doesn't, so you can choose any reference. This, this works the same. But you have basically that your pitch realization is going to be the your reference pitch plus the interval from the reference pitch which you're trying to sing plus an error right? um, because of course we don't sing perfectly and then we have we make the assumption that the reference pitch then is changing over time because we observe drift uh, and how does the reference pitch change well we assume that the reference pitch changes by some fraction of the error that occurs. So basically your reference pitch is going to stay the same as the previous reference pitch. Well, that would be the normal thing. If you're singing in the key of A, let's say, and you're choosing A that's 440 hertz as your reference, then you assume that after singing a few notes, your A will still be 440 hertz. But of course, if you sing a few notes that are a bit sharper than that, than what they should have been, then maybe your idea of A will also be influenced by that. Because of course, you won't be able to remember unless you've got perfect pitch, I'm not dealing with that case here, uh, you won't be able to remember your reference note from the start of the piece if you keep singing lots of notes out of tune. Right? Eventually you're going to forget. Right? And so this is this parameter mu is about like your memory. Right? Mu is a value from 0 to 1. If it's close to 1, then your reference doesn't change much from the reference at time i minus 1. If it's close to 0, of course, it's memory disappears and you're just taking this value which is your 
local reference. The difference between the note that you just, your previous note, right, your note at time minus one, the pitch you just sang, minus the score note. So, right, so how far was it away from what it should have been? Uh, and that gives you a, a measure of the, kind of the, um, the local um, reference. Right, and so we can uh, rearrange this to, to express it in these terms of that your the reference note at, at time i is the reference note at time i minus one plus the error multiplied by one minus mu. So that's so the, the error if you sing a bit sharp, then that will move your reference pitch up by one minus mu times how much how big the error is. Um, Okay, so that was our model. Um, and to explain this model, we have this slightly skew looking picture that kind of makes you feel a bit seasick. It just looks like something went wrong with it. But the reason it's gone wrong is because it's drift. That's the thing I'm So the notes that were sung are these notes. Here's, here's a piece of music. And then if we subtract the note, the, the score, so the notes that should have been sung, then we end up with this, these black diamonds, and there we can fit a straight line to that. So that's our reference pitch. Right? But these black are these other the, the reference pitch. We fit a, fit a line to that, and then we can look at the errors at any point in time, and now relative to this tonal centre, shifting tonal centre over time, and that's how we understand um, what people are doing. Now, why this should be a straight line is, you know, I mean, there's no reason it should not be a straight line, but it's, you know, you have to approximate it somehow. It's better than assuming it's constant, right? So it's a first order approximation. Of course, it would be better to use a more local estimate. But it's only a short piece of music, so it works fine for 25 notes. Um, okay, so let's think about this memory parameter. So the two boundary cases that we can consider uh, one is that you have no memory at all, and the other is that you have perfect memory of the reference pitch. Right? So the, if you have um, the case that where mu is set to zero, then the previous note realisation is, is what's used for reference. So basically, when you sing a note, you sing happy birthday to you. And my next note is going to be based on the interval that should be sung from the you. I've forgotten everything else I sung before that. I don't know what K I mean, I just know you. And I have to sing the next note. I don't know that it should be from you to uh, OK, so I have to sing down that far. OK, that's that model. Um, if this model is true, then any error we make, any note that's sung in tune, will affect every other note after that. So if I sing half a semitone sharp on one pitch, then every other note should be half a semitone sharp, apart from new errors they introduce afterwards. OK, so the variance of the pitches will increase over time, right? I mean, it should be just exploding, right? Random, uh, heading towards kind of some random tonal centre by the end of the piece. Uh, we do not observe this at all. We observe huge errors in singing, um, interval errors, but they don't accumulate. So people do have some memory beyond, or going back before the, the, the note they're currently singing. Um, okay, that's you know not surprising. Second boundary case, mu equals one. The reference pitch is maintained perfectly. We don't drift at all. And of course, this doesn't agree with our um, our observations either. So what we found in this work was that the value of mu equals 0.85 was the best fit across the whole data set. And in fact, we could calculate a, different values of mu for different people. Some people have stronger memory of the reference pitch, some people have less memory, and so people's values would vary from about 0 0.65 to 0 0.9, um, where the kind of the distribution of, of values of mu that gives the best fit to that model. Right? And the model's not perfect, but we're saying the linear fit is not really the, you know, it's not plausible at all, but it's, you know, it's a rough approximation and it's a starting point. Um, okay, so just to summarise the results from this work, the median note error, so people singing, uh, tend to sing 19 cents out. So the absolute, median absolute 
error in, in uh, uh, singing pitch. This is relative to the tuning world. Median interval error, 27 cents. So this is how well people sing or how badly people sing. Now comparing that to how we're worried about two cents when we tune harpsichords, um, it's quite an interesting result is how badly people sing. Now these are not professional singers, although some of them sing in, so quite a few of them sing in choirs in, in well-known uh, universities. Um, the errors were correlated with choir experience negatively, right? so the choir experience decreases errors, uh, and self-reported singing ability, but not correlated with musical background, or not significantly at least. Um, so that was an interesting result. And that's just self-reported data. Um, now, compare this. The drift from one piece to the third piece, this is 50 notes later, if you like, the, the, the third rendition starts 50 notes later on the first one, uh, is 11 cents. Each interval has a median error of 27 cents. So the error is not accumulating, right? It's not. In fact, people somehow, people, there were some remarkable recordings where people were singing like an octave interval was nine semitones or 9.3 semitones. So really, really out of tune, like not just slightly out. And yet they could, after singing this piece, which vaguely had the contour of having birthday, but wasn't anything like what we'd hoped to hear, um, they could start the second rendition on precisely the same pitch they started the first one on. It was quite a remarkable thing that there's, uh, <laughs> you know, that you assume that people have no, that their tone depth would seem that badly, but it seems to be more of a production error, right? They don't have control over the vocal cords, uh, rather than, you know, perception error that they can't hear what the pitch should be, even if they have no, you know. But anyway, that was the results. Um, we didn't get a whole lot of drift, like, you know, a lot of people didn't drift significantly, so we did a significant step and found that 22% you know, of the recordings, there, were, there was significant drift, and surprisingly it wasn't downwards, it was actually slightly more of the drift was upward than downward, which is different from at least what any choir conductor would say. Um, maybe all these people sing in choirs and they've been indoctrinated not to drift downwards, and <laughs> they're overcompensating, I don't know. Um, Interestingly, drift magnitude did not correlate with uh, any of the measures of singing accuracy or singing experience. So, just self so unlike the interval errors, which were very much to do with do you sing regularly in a choir, that type of thing, and if you do, then you sing better. Uh, drift seems totally, so whether you can remember where you are in, the, in terms of a, a tonal reference, doesn't seem to correlate with any, anything, um, any of the measures that we had. Um, okay, we, we had ended up with this, this model that I showed you, where you, you can't have, you know, the idea of having no memory or having perfect memory is, is not supported by the data. Um, and we found a kind of a, a model which is causal, it doesn't rely on any future data, it's just, you know, based on the, for the kind of the, the past, we can predict kind of where people are approximately going to sing. Um, okay, so that's a summary of that. Uh, I have run out of time, but I would like to, well, I'd like to thank all the people who've worked on these projects and did a lot of the, the work, and very quickly show you a piece of uh, software which we use for analyzing the singing, if I can. Now, I should have warned you that I I'm not a Mac user, I'm using this Mac because my hard drive crashed last week and I haven't got a new computer yet. And so, um, so what I should actually do is start from the beginning and load a new piece of music into this because it's cheating, it's already existing. So if I just open a file, here's a recording of somebody singing, and this is a more recent one that we haven't finished analysing yet. So we just open an audio file, uh, I don't want to say that, no. So I open an audio file. This is somebody singing, and this experiment we asked them to sing intervals like uh, da, 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 just repeat singing two pictures alternating. Um, and so I've just I, I've just loaded the audio audio file. I'll play it to you. Have I got the sound switched off? I think I did it.
Okay, and what the, the software has done is it's trying to segment it into nodes, and it nearly always gets it right. Occasionally it gets it wrong and gets, it thinks that's not one node but two, but this can be very easily, now see if I can remember which keys it is on the Mac, because it's different keys, but uh, if I want to correct this, I do this, and I merge the two nodes together, and that becomes one node. And so here we can look at each of the nodes, and we can export this data immediately. So these six nodes, I've got a frequency of 176.303 hertz, 225.918, and so on. So it's already calculated the median, and um, right, so it's almost totally automatic, uh, apart from these few cases like here where, where it's over-segmented, and we need to, um, to, to do a bit of work to, to merge them together just by selecting them and saying merge these two nodes. Um, and then we can, having done that, we can do things yeah, well. Yeah, okay, we're yeah. listening to the person singing, but instead of listening to the person yeah. singing, we can switch that off and listen to the pitch track that's been detected. So, there you can hear the, the variation in, in pitch because it's following the actual, all of the point estimates. Of the pitch, and then we can also listen to the instead of that just to the notes. So these are now the median values. Oh, yeah, so you hear some drift there. Right. And so that's the tool in a few seconds. I don't want to go too much over time, so I'll stop there. And uh, I don't know, we've got time for questions. Well, thank you very much. Well, we, I'm sure we have enough time for a few questions if anybody uh, has one. Yes. Can, can I take you back to the harpsichord stuff? Yes. Um, you, you pointed out that the harpsichord has an in harmonic frequency spectrum. And um, bearing in mind that the Pitch identification uh, is not necessarily the fundamental frequency, particularly for a, a very low note. I wondered how you actually define the pitch of an inharmonic spectrum. Ah, okay. So I define it in terms of there's an equation for an inharmonic spectrum of the, the frequency of the nth harmonic is mm -hmm. the fundamental times yeah. the, the uh, n, the, the harmonic number, times the square root of 1 plus b n squared. Um, so we calculate that F0 in that equation mm -hmm. as, the, as the value. It's not the procedure. That's not the pitch. It's, no, it's not. But what can you do, right? Now, um, I did look in the JASA paper, we did look, I did some analysis and I reported on that, uh, saying, well, looking at kind of this case of do you tune, let's say we're tuning an octave, do you tune it so that the, because if it's in, in harmonic, do you tune it so that the harmonics coincide? And of course you can tune it which harmonics then? Do you tune the, the let's say you tune an octave, do you tune the first harmonic of this one to the second harmonic of this one? Or do you tune the fourth of this one to the second? And, and so on. Right? Um, and I looked at the, how much difference it makes. And actually for the har in harmonicity of the harpsichord, it's, it's down to one or two cents, that it doesn't actually make any difference. Uh, in the worst, worst case of assuming the, the greatest in harmonicity, the note with the greatest in harmonicity, and the, you know, and tuning, uh, you know, the second or third harmonic to the sixth or whatever, that type of thing, it made a difference of one and a half cents or something like that. So, in that sense, it, don't, it doesn't make a difference. Of course, with piano, we'd really be in trouble, um, I think, yeah. But, yeah. Piano tuners uh, do tune like that, like they think in terms of tuning which one they which pair of partials they're tuning to, to a great. Um, and apparently they're talking in these terms of, I can't remember the terminology they use for it, but, but um, I've certainly read about that. Could that actually become a time constant? Just uh, 
Yeah, um, I mean, here we just did it by, uh, let me think, yeah, we did it by note because, well, we had, I mean, everyone's singing at the same tempo because we had a click track. Uh, so, so it kind of means that everyone's, we're treating everything the same way, it's not a problem. But, but yes, yeah, so if it's a memory thing, then of course it should be time-based and not necessarily note-based, but then musically, you'd assume after 10 notes, Maybe you're confused as to what the first note was. Like if you're singing to ten notes and ask you to sing the first one, it might be hard to do. <laughs> you might be more confused if you sing them for longer. Well, yes. So, so I'm sure time makes an effect, but, but perhaps the number of notes also makes an effect. So that maybe you know you might need to consider both of those things together. I'm, I'm not sure, um, but certainly there's you know, a lot of scope to to uh, improve this model. I mean, it's a very fundamental kind of you know, rough. First estimate. It's all it's supposed to be. It's not supposed to really explain anything, but it, it at least has some fit to the data, and, and you know, gives us something to, to work from. It. And that's why we did this second experiment, where we got we actually got people to sing every interval from from plus twelve to minus twelve semitones, singing two notes alternating, uh, so five groups of six notes, and to, to look at you know drift and and look at what interval they start singing and do they end up singing the same interval, but we're still analysing that data, so um, hopefully that can help us improve the model. Let's see. I have maybe one question about your, your singing example, which is that, do you, do you have any uh, data or any idea of how that these results change when, when the singer has accompaniment? Say, I mean, obviously you would expect them to get better if they had kind of some absolute reference of accompaniment, but something, there must be some kind of, I don't know, there's some process between one person singing on their own and then 20 people singing together. Well, it's incredibly complex, of course, the dynamics of, of a, an ensemble. Um, at least, singing is, is going to be, I mean, I'd love to do that, exactly the experiment, or, you know, just do a string quartet or something. Um, Singing with a piano is a much simpler case, of course, because the piano, pianists can't change the pitch of what they're playing. <laughs> you know, there's no negotiation involved, right? The piano is right, and you have to sing so that it sounds good with that piano, no matter, you know, even if it's tuned with equal um, uh, So it's an interesting question, and it's interesting that people talk a lot about temperament or, or you know, intonation in, in singing and stuff, and these, you know, the importance of pure intervals, and, you know, barbershop and stuff is always talked about, but then. When you measure what normal people sing, uh, the errors are so large that you know the, the difference between equal temperament and, and velocity is is just is totally irrelevant, um, you know, for, for singing. And, and if you look at just even the pitch trajectory within a note, uh, you know, I mean, there are huge differences. Right? So it's 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 interesting. That singing um, is is a special case. There's some work I, I heard about in um, music psychology where they looked at I think it was uh, the violin and singing were compared. And if you play out a tune by a certain number of cents, people notice it, notice it. But for singing, it has to be the error has to be like five times as great or ten times as great. I can't remember the exact number, but it was a huge factor more uh, before people recognised it as being out of tune. So our threshold of you know <laughs> forgiveness or whatever <laughs> for being out of tune is much much higher for singing. Which, you know, I think it might be the reverse of that because we spend so much time listening to people speak. Yeah. So, uh, uh, just a uh, uh, comment on that last remark. Uh, I, I, I don't know whether I was the only person who thought the pitch uh, glides in that singing example you played when you were demonstrating the software seemed much more obvious when it was just the pitch track uh, sound rather than the actual timbre of the voice. Yes, yes, exactly. It's uh, amazing, like if you oralize it, you know, yeah. sonify it in this, in this way, you suddenly hear it. Um, and it sounds very unnatural, of course, because it's not. But, sorry, doesn't that thing. have to do as well with this, like when you sing, sing it, you're singing out your, like, well, well, I don't know if it's also called quality factor in, mm. in singing, but like, so the, the harmonic center is like spread, has a bigger, has a wider range than. If you play a MIDI note, it's only going to have like a really defined frequency, but not not the human voice. It spreads over a wider range, so your ear doesn't really. It's like if you put a harmonizer to on any sound you have, 
like you can kind of mask. Yeah, yeah, this fact, that's one factor. There's also the, the um, loudness factor, isn't it? which is getting lost here because you know we're assuming the note is either on or off, whereas of course as you a lot of these a lot of the glides, especially between the notes, when you actually listen to it, there's nothing there, you can't hear it, but the pitch tracker has picked it up. Um, it's extremely quiet. So uh, so you know when we're playing it back I guess we should synthesize it with the correct uh, volume level so you can if, if you want to hear. I mean it depends what you want to do, right? <laughs> Um, you want to kind of get a more realistic experience of what the, the singing sounds like. Um. Anybody with a final question? And as well, did, did you mention something that's a proposed causal model for your memory? So yep. looking at um, kind of future, is there anything you can mention about any work done on that yet? Well, the, the model I explained that kind of how we model it with this memory parameter is a causal model. Right? It's, it's not using... I mean, what we wanted to do first was do this linear fit. But linear fit's not causal, right? because you're fitting to the whole data set before you know where your reference is at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, so, so the model that we use uh, doesn't do that. It, it only bases on the past data, so the, the, the one with the mu parameter is a causal model. And, and it, you know, so it makes... It's plausible, right? It makes some type of sense, and you know, it, it seems to fit. I mean, the idea of memory, I mean, it's clear that memory is involved in this process of, of singing, yeah. uh, that you have to be. You know, so it kind of makes sense, but it's you know, it's a very rough approximation. I, I, I suppose that was. But the, the thing I was going to know is, it, are there any models out there that kind of use kind of future memory or most? Because I suppose with something like Happy, happy Birthday. People have it in their mind, they know what. So, when you were talking about how you have that pitch drift up as yeah. it goes to the octave, like, do you have any, like, other than just like being able to describe it, is there any work done that kind of predicts that? Uh, I don't think there's any models that predict anything like that. I mean, we know that, you know, in anticipation of a, of a change in pitch that people start moving up early, that's known, but uh, in terms of quantifying it, no, I don't think there's anything. And you know we don't have any musical context in this. This is part of the reason we're doing this experiment, where we're asking people to sing every possible interval, because then we want to see are consonant intervals easier to sing and more accurate than you know dissonant intervals. We expect a tritone is harder to sing than a fifth, you know, even though it's smaller. Uh, obviously, larger intervals are harder than smaller ones in general. But you know we're kind of trying to build up the piece, the pieces that would help us to make such a model. Um, yeah, there's a lot. Of a lot of factors that would have to be concluded. I think uh, the, the kind of anticipation of what's coming next would be one. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for such an interesting talk, Simon. I think we'll thank you.